Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the lecture on calculation and socialism. Uh, the title might uh, at first seem a little obscure, but uh, I hope to uh, um, explain the importance of, of economic calculation uh, by showing how its uh, absence under socialism causes severe problems and actually the impossibility of, of socialism. And this is particularly topical because we have people now calling for socialism openly in the U.S. once again. Um, less than, or a little bit more than two decades after the collapse of the Soviet Union and uh, the Eastern European centralized uh, uh, central planning uh, regimes. So Bernie Sanders, for example, um, the woman, I, I don't remember her name, who was elected as an open socialist in the Bronx in New York last week, uh, I, or, or maybe she was um, nominated uh, as a Democratic candidate, which is tantamount in New York to getting, to being automatically uh, elected. Okay, I what I want to do is I want to start with what I consider to be the, the greatest single economics article of the 20th century uh, for a number of reasons. And that was Logan von Mises' Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. Uh, it, it was uh, published in 1920. Uh, we've reprinted it. Uh, we have a, a, a pamphlet reprint with an epilogue by a, a quite notable uh, modern Austrian economist. So I, I urge you to, to read it through. Make sure you read the epilogue. Uh, okay. So what it did was, first of all, it completely destroyed in one fell swoop the intellectual foundations of socialism. But as we've discovered later on during the Austrian revival, it also really... Um, set out what exactly the nature and the function of the price system was in a capitalist economy. It really showed the importance of the price system. Um, that lesson was not learned uh, un until uh, the, uh, what we call the Austrian revival, the second lesson. So let me start with the early socialists who wrote in the early 1800s, the early part of the 19th century. Um, there were three big names. If you've had history of economic thought, you've seen these names before. There was a French, uh, the two French um, writers, Charles Fourier and Henri Saint-Simon, and um, a Scottish uh, entrepreneur who set up uh, socialist experiments here in the United States, Robert Owen, um, as, did, as did Fourier's followers. We'll talk about that. Uh, they were called the utopian socialists, okay? They had all these grand schemes that they would set out in minute detail about how people will live better if they just go along with, with, with their ideas and their visions. Um, as we'll see, Marx took a very different tack, okay? Marx was a brilliant strategist, a brilliant tactician, and he hated these guys, and for good reason, okay? Um, that's Charles, Charles Fourier. He's as crazy as he looks. <laughs> no, seriously. Okay, we'll focus on him as, 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 the, uh, proto, uh, as the stereotypical um, utopian socialist. Um, he had an idea that there should be, people should be organized into small communities of phalansteres, which are the, the, the old military formation of the Greeks, uh, the phalanx. Um, he said that there would be garden cities modeled after a grand hotel. Okay, this is the way people would live. There would be 15 to 1,600 people in these, in these cities, um, and it, would, it was based on the Greek military formation. Everybody would be able to purchase accommodations according to his individual tastes and income, so he wasn't a, a leveler, an income leveler necessarily. Um, everybody would be a stockholder in the city. There would be collective production. Now everyone would, would, would produce the same things together, okay? They would all share the dirty work and uh, share meals in the kitchen. So that doesn't look too crazy, but then as you go on and you read more in Fourier, you understand why Marx was so embarrassed as a socialist. Okay, so he actually sketched out, this is what it would look like. These, these crazy utopian socialists had this mania for symmetry. Everything had to be symmetrical, right? You know, the phalanx was, you know, like a square or a rectangle. Okay. And he uh, went as far as to actually build a model of it. Okay. I mean, this is really bespeaks a mania. Okay, now there's one near my home in New Jersey. There was actually a, a phalanx there that was built, and people lived in for a while in New Jersey. Um, and it's been long since abandoned, okay? Looks haunted to me. I don't go near it. Okay, now here, here's some of, uh, of his writings, his ramblings. Um, 
So he, uh, so he wrote that, uh, said that 19th century fa France was in the fifth stage of advancement. Now, how does he know this stuff? Okay, I mean, how does he know that it started with confusion, the world, and then went to savagery, patriarchism, barbarity? Now, and then he said, at the point he was writing, after passing through two more stages, it would approach the upward slope of harmony. Now, that's the final stage of utter bliss, and that will last for 8,000 years. Okay, <laughs> 8,000 years. He knows that. Okay. Uh, at which point, of course, history would reverse itself and you'd go back through savagery to confusion. Okay. So these people are what we call Gnostics. They all have a secret source of knowledge within them that no one else shares. So I mean, this is the, this is, every cult is, is based on what we call Gnosticism, okay, the Greek word for knowledge, um, meaning sort of a secret intuition that no one else shares. Marx had the same thing. Um, uh, other things, he said, would happen. So when you reach this stage of harmony, There'd be six new moons, replace the one in existence. Uh, a halo would surround the North Pole, and it would shower dew on the Earth. Uh, the seas would turn to Kool-Aid, okay? It's some kind of a juice. I mean, uh, it's all, I, I've looked at a few books, and they say Kool-Aid. I don't think Kool-Aid existed back then, unless he invented it. And James, and James Jones, right? They're all infatuated with Kool-Aid at Jonestown. I don't know. All violent or repulsive beasts would be, be replaced by their opposites and would be serviceable. Anti-lions would offer themselves to humans to be ridden, and roasted anti-chickens would fly into human mouths. <laughs> and the human lifespan in the harmonic stage would stretch to 144 years. I mean, they, they, you know, they had these exact figures. How do they know this stuff? Uh, and five-sixths of the time, not six-sevenths or four-fifths, five-sixths would be devoted to the unrestrained pursuit of sexual love. Free love was always a part of all of these schemes, okay, all of which, of course, have been made up by men. Right. No, it's, it's true, though. To the left always you know, says that capitalism mistreats women, but, but in all of the schemes that the left has come up with, all these crazy schemes over the centuries, you know, uh, you know, you always have these sort of free love schemes. Okay, so what were the responses of the classical economists? Well, they were able to smash this stuff very easily. They said, look, who's going to take out, out the garbage on this utopian socialism? Okay, there's going to be still dirty work to do. Who's going to go deep down into the mines? Who's, who, who's going to do uh, unhealthy jobs, potentially da uh, dangerous jobs, if everybody gets paid the same? Um, so uh, they pointed out, obviously, the price system provides the needed incentives and, and, and signals and, uh, through the profit and loss system, which would um, uh, induce the right amounts of goods to be supplied uh, to, 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 to society, whereas you don't have that under any of these crazy socialist, uh, utopian socialist schemes. But the uh, socialist answer was there'd be a new socialist man and woman, okay? That is, that they'd be mysteriously transformed and they'd all want to work for the community. Well, th that argument went on for a while. But, and, of course, the classical economists, who were smart people, brilliant people, got the better of it. However, there was an underlying um, assumption that if it wasn't for the lack of incentives under socialism, socialism could be just as, pro as, as productive as capitalism, okay? Now that's, as we'll see, what Mises challenged, okay? That it was just incentives, that the incentives weren't right. Unfortunately, in, today, in today's modern economic mainstream, people have sort of focused on incentives as a core of economics, when in fact it's not, as we'll see, really truly really calculation, okay? Even if you know, or even if everyone has the uh, right attitudes, and if everyone sort of was uh, an angel in their disposition and wanted to help society, you would still have uh, socialism not being able to work. Okay. So now Marx, as I said, was, was, was a brilliant strat uh, st uh, strategist and, and tactician, and he saw how clearly the, the utopian socialists had been smashed by the classical economists. So what he said was, look, um, utopian socialists aren't scientific. Don't listen to them. Anyone who tries to tell you they know what's going to, 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 to how, how the future is going to look, um, or tries to devise a plan to implement in the future, is, is not scientific, they're just crazy, don't pay attention to them. Because according to Marx, um, it's the laws of history that's going to drive society, regardless of what anybody thinks or wants, it's going to drive society from 
the beginning in, in, in classical slavery, through feudalism, through capitalism, through a stage of socialism, and then ultimately to the bliss of communism. He said, this is going to come about as inexorably as the laws of nature dictate that an apple, if it falls from a tree, will fall downward and not upward. Okay? There's nothing that human beings can do about it. There's no way that human beings can hasten the coming of socialism. So forget about it. If you, if you, say any, if you try to describe what it's going to look like, then you're unscientific. Okay? So it's unscientific to speculate about what a future social society would look like or to try to speed up its arrival. Even though later on in his career, Marx was contradicting himself because Marx was uh, someone who was an agitator and agitated for, for, for socialist measures. Okay. He was even against minimum wage laws. He was against unions because he actually thought that those things would make the working class more amenable to capitalism. He thought that he wanted things to get as bad as possible just through the working out of the laws of history, and then we would just pass into socialism. So he was an anti, actually, Marx was an anti-interventionist in some of his writings. Um, so his writings weren't, what was his great work called? It wasn't called socialism, okay? It wasn't called communism, it was called capitalism, das Kapital. He didn't write a word about socialism, about the socialist future, what it would look like, okay? He just spent all his time talking about the economic contradictions that would cause capitalism to collapse with the inexorability of the laws of nature. So this is, this is where we stood when Mises wrote. So what Mises focused on was not the incentives. He focused on the function of the price system. And what he, what he said, well, this is his thesis. We'll start with the thesis. He, he came out and said socialism, a socialist economy, and I'll explain what I mean more by that, but right now let's just say that when Mises uses the term socialism, he means an economy in which a co one collective, uh, the, um, the go let's say the government, whether it's a dictatorship of the proletariat or not, um, the government owns all of the physical means of production. That is, all the factories, all the natural resources, all the machinery, all the tools. Okay? There can be consumer goods that were privately owned under socialism. Okay? Even some durable consumer goods. Okay? Though it's not clear about housing, for example, okay? if that would be, owned, be able to be privately owned. But certainly all the factors of production or, or non-human means of production. Labor would be free. I mean, Mises allowed that labor could, could be free under socialism to choose different jobs. And there could be a limited sort of money uh, where the laborers were paid vouchers, which they could then turn into the stores that were all owned by the state for different kinds of goods. So, so Mises um, um, granted that, OK, we would have con some consumer choice given what was produced, that people could choose between different things that were produced. But the key is that every all, all the productive apparatus throughout the economy would be, would be owned by the government. Okay. So it would be collective ownership of the means of production. That's how it's usually phrased. So what he said is that in a developed industrial economy with complicated production processes, okay, as we have here in the United States and we've had since the Industrial Revolution, many different kinds of capital goods, um, many pro production processes and many different kinds of capital goods, the rational allocation of resources is, imp is impossible without economic calculation using actual market prices. A socialist economy is impossible because it cannot generate prices for capital goods and, and natural resources. Okay, well, let's parse Mises' argument. Mises said, step one, socialism abolishes private property and capital goods and natural resources. Okay, one will controls them. It's either uh, you know, a, a, a single central planner or a group of, 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 of economists or uh, others that, uh, technicians and so on, that come up with the, uh, the central plan. Number two, since a socialist state is the sole owner of the material factors of production, they can no longer be exchanged, right? You can't exchange with yourself, okay? If there can be no exchange, there can be no markets and no market prices. So there'll be no prices for the factors of production. Therefore, the state, without prices of the factors of production, cannot calculate the costs of production to compare to the prices if there are, if consumers are given free choice, the prices that consumers are willing to pay for consumer goods. So you would have no costs of production. Um, in the absence of economic calculation of profit and loss, 
Therefore, socialist planners cannot know the valuable uses of scarce resources, and therefore, a socialist economy is, strictly speaking, impossible. And Mises said it's like a man standing in the middle of a desert, uh, and uh, you know, he has his equipment and so on and so forth uh, uh, to last him to get out of the desert, but he doesn't know which way to go. He has no compass. There's no best way to go to, to get out of the desert. Okay. He, there's many different ways to go, okay. um, different directions. Well, that's what the socialist planner is like. Okay. There's no calculation. We'll, we'll get to this in more detail. Um, and very interestingly, he said the essential mark of socialism, okay, now he didn't say that the essential is, is compulsion or is the fact that um, you've abolished markets. He pinpointed that there's one will alone acting. If there's one will alone acting, it means all the different values, expectations, um, tastes, uh, uh, ideas about how to produce, all those different things can come into play in markets. Can't be, there can't be uh, an interchange in markets of different values which then establish prices of every single order of good, okay? Going from mining iron ore and, and mining diamonds all the way down to consumer goods, okay? The stores that provide consumer goods. So he says, it is immaterial whose will it is. So it could be the will of an angel. It could be the will of, the, of, the best, of, of a benign dictator, someone who really wants to help society. The main thing is that the employment of all factors of production is directed by one agency only. One will alone chooses, decides, directs, acts, gives orders. Uh, the distinctive mark of socialism is the oneness and indivisibility of the will directing all production activities within the whole social system. Okay. It's not incentives. There's not a word about incentives in there, okay, which, which is, is, is so, um, so, so much the central focus of, of economics today. Okay. It, it, it's it, this one will. So what Mises said is, in order to have economic calculation, you need private property, not just in consumer goods, but in all stages of goods, including capital goods of every kind. Okay. You need the freedom to exchange these goods. You know, in, in, in past history, uh, you, you had uh, certain laws that allowed people to own property, but they couldn't sell, sell the property, okay? The family couldn't divide up and sell the property. But, but you have to have freedom to, to exchange as well as private property, and a sound money, a, a money whose value is independent of, of, of the will of, of politicians and, and, the, uh, and their machinations. So socialism abolishes all three of these preconditions and therefore it nullifies economic calculation, and as we'll see, so society itself. Okay. So let's look at why calculation might be a problem. Um, let's say that we have a production function, which is a fancy word that economists use for recipe. Uh, if you look at Murray Rothbard, he has no qualms about using the word recipe in man, economy, and state. You know, um, he uses production functions sometimes, but it's just simply a recipe. Every good has a, has a numerous technical recipe. Many, each good can be produced in many different ways. So let's say you have a car um, that requires P tons of steel, Q hours of machine time, R hours of unskilled labor, and so on, en engineering labor, square feet of factory space, kilowatt hours of electricity, and paint, and so on. The socialist planners can know all this. They can know all the recipes. They can know all the technical production functions. Uh, how to produce all goods. But without prices and, and without costs, we'll see that this is, um, uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, help them to, to produce the right quantities and kinds of goods that people d d demand. Or that even that they themselves want people to have. It's even a problem if they try to substitute their own values because they can't put prices on, 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 on those things. So um, how can the, uh, we calculate the cost of producing this car under socialism? Okay. You can add up kilowatts of hours, tons of steel, gallons of paint. It's not a common unit. There's no single unit to express costs of production. How do we do it on the market? On the market, okay, all resources at every moment have a price because they're all privately owned and they're all continually exchanged. Okay. So they have a price. And so therefore, you add up the prices of those quantities given by the production function of goods and inputs that you need to build the car, and you come up with some kind of a cost of production. Um, so let's say the cost of the car is $30,000, right? 
Now, you don't know for sure what consumers will be willing to pay for the price. That's an entrepreneur, uh, pay for the item. That's an entrepreneurial judgment. You have to look to the future for that. Entrepreneurs can make mistakes, but when they make mistakes, unlike the socialist planners, they know they make mistakes because of profit and loss. So if they um, project the price of $34,000, let's say this car is just being planned. In, in the US, it takes about five to seven years to get a car from the drawing board onto the dealer's floor. Okay, so you're looking five years in the future, you, you, you produce a car, um, thinking you're going to get 34000 for it, it costs you 30000 to produce, and yet by the time you get that car in the market, there's some good uh, competing cars that, that people might prefer, so you're only able to sell them for 28000 Yeah, entrepreneurs make mistakes. That was a waste of resources, because they used resources worth $30,000 in other lines of production, Remember, other entrepreneurs are bidding for the steel, the paint, and so on, the labor hours. And they're willing to pay up the $30,000 because they can produce goods and services worth about $30,000 to consumers. Well, this guy believed that he could make a better package of the $30,000 and turn it into $34,000. Well, he was wrong. That's fine. That, that, that's, that's not that uh, devastating to running an economy. Okay? If he continues to make those mistakes, if she continues to make those mistakes as an entrepreneur, they drop out. Okay. They, they lose their capital. So there was a woman uh, a number of years ago, back in the 1990s, who came up with some, uh, a, a, a something called um, a top, topsy tail. And what that was was simply a hoop, uh, a knitting hoop, uh, and uh, a, a, a needle, a plastic hoop and, and, and a, a long needle that she put together in a way that women could easily braid their hair if they had long hair. Um, because she, she had long hair and she was always wor worried about doing this. That cost her about a dollar. She quit IBM, uh, took her $5,000 of savings and started to advertise. Eventually went on TV, um, on QVC, and um, she was selling them for $15 and, at the end and making them for, fifth, for, for 25 or 30 cents, okay? So that, that, she calculated that, look, I can make it for less than a dollar and yet I, can, I, I project I can sell for 10 or $15. And she became a, a millionaires. And um, her subsequent endeavors failed, but, but in any case, uh, so, so calculation made her come up with this item that no one else had thought of, using inputs that were worth only 25 cents to make something that was worth $10, $10 or $15. Now, what about, can, can socialist planners do this type of thing? No, because they don't know their cost of production. They don't know what anything costs. They never know if, if they're using resources that are more valuable than the, the goods that they're, they're, they're um, producing, okay? So um, also, do you use a titanium bumper on a car, a steel bumper on a car, or do you use a fiberglass bumper on a car? Okay. Well, titanium is stronger than steel, but it's lighter than steel. But we don't use titanium bumpers because it's calculated that the cost of the titanium bumper, which would pre you know, prevent denting of the bumper at much higher speed accidents, that that cost is too high. People will not pay the extra amount to avoid uh, you know, the paying for the accidents, paying for the accidents, or the reduction in accidents, okay? Um, and in fact, we've gone from steel to, to, a, to a fiberglass bumper. That's kind of counterintuitive. Why, why have we done that? Well, because the, the, the repairing a fiberglass bumper isn't as costly as, as the extra weight of the steel bumper that reduces your gas mileage and so all of these things are done through calculation. Socialist uh, planner could never figure this stuff out. Okay, now um, there's a story behind that house. I have a friend uh, who I grew up with, and she um, married a cowboy, a real cowboy, who actually had a ranch um, with cattle and stuff on it, and they actually had cattle drives. So she moved to Montana, and um, one day she called me and she said, uh, we, have, we have a new house. I said, oh, you, you moved? She said, no, no, no. She says, oh, we just had the old house removed, and we replaced it with a, a new house. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, yeah, it's a seven-bedroom house. This isn't actually her house. This is a modular house. So I said, what do you mean you replaced it with, you know, you bought it in another house? She said, well, in Montana, because there's like 18 people in Montana. <laughs> so there's hardly any labor. Labor is extremely scarce. So people don't come to the, it's, it's very expensive to get people to come to the site and build the house. They don't do that. What they do is, they have the house built in Omaha. Well, actually, in Nebraska somewhere. And I, I happened to look at uh, Google it today, and there's 
a number of, of house building um, firms all throughout um, Nebraska. So they had it shipped about 700 miles to their house and shipped it on trucks and then they put it together there, okay? They only had to spend a few days putting it together, so you know, scarce labor was economized on. Would a socialist planner ever figure that out, that a house should be built 700 miles away? How is it figured out here? By prices, by, no, by saying, hey, the cost of actually building this thing 700 miles away with a lot of machinery and few laborers in a factory is less than having a lot of laborers come and you know, uh, uh, stay for four months, five months, and, and, and build here in um, um, Montana. Okay? And there literally was less than 20 people in that town of Biddle where she lived. They, they, her, her family was the postmaster. They ran the store. Um, I, she, I, I never visited. I just I couldn't, couldn't bring myself to go there. <laughs> okay. All right. So now, a couple things that Mises did and did not say. Mises didn't say that if you had a, t a small economy, one person or a small household, living in isolation, that they couldn't run a rational economy. So um, he said, you don't, when, when people are acting in isolation or there are small groups acting and you don't have um, very complicated production processes and a lot of producers' goods, many different capital goods, you can use valuation. You can simply just value things directly, which you can't do under socialism uh, in an industrial economy. So let's say you have somebody who has, works 12 hours a day and this is their value scale. This is how they value the different things that they could produce. Okay? And let's say that's what they produce every day, two fish, three pounds of wild mushrooms, and so on. Um, and all together, it absorbs the 12 hours. Let's say now they find uh, rabbits on the um, island, this, this household or Robinson Crusoe. Um, what's the cost of producing a rabbit that requires six hours to hunt and catch? They can figure that out pretty easily because it's just just a, a few people there, and they can say, well, you know what? It'll cost us the satisfaction from the eight coconuts and one sack of berries. So with the six hours that we use to catch a rabbit, we value the rabbit directly more than the um, uh, eight coconuts and one sack of berries. So Mises didn't deny that you always needed calculation, or didn't deny that, that, that sometimes you, 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 you could have a situation where calculation wasn't, wasn't as important. But he even said in that case, he said, Crusoe would not think and act like a man who could calculate. Okay? He would even miss some opportunities because he couldn't calculate. But you, you, you could have a sort of a rational economy. Okay? Because you could, direct these, you could directly know your opportunity costs. But in a complicated economy with, with very, very complicated technological processes and many, many different kinds of capital goods that can be used in many, many different ways, there's literally an infinite way. If you take the United States today and you were put in charge, okay, as a central planner, um, you would it'd be very difficult for you to even absorb all of the different types of, 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 of goods that you had at your disposal to produce to serve people's wants. You could know what you would like to, to have people produce, uh, consume. You could also know the lists of all the, all the capital goods and factories and, re and natural resources. But you, you, there's no way you could use prices. You couldn't figure out your cost of production or producing any one thing. Should I produce, um, let's say, uh, 1,000 more bicycles or one more car? Or, or, or let's say 10 more cars. You, you, would, could, you wouldn't know. There's no way to rationally make the decision. OK. How did they do it in a, a, a former Soviet Union? Um, there was the central planning agency called Ghost Plan. Uh, they used uh, gro gross output planning. I'll just give you some examples of how this went awry. Um, what Ghost Plan did was to set targets for each particular industry. And then the, 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 the manager in charge of the whole industry, the director of the industry himself, would then allocate uh, targets to each of the different firms or factories that um, constituted that industry, okay? But it was very difficult. If you give people a target, you have to give it in terms of, 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 of homogeneous units. So if you tell people to, to produce tons of nails, what happened in the Soviet Union? They produced these huge nails, okay? <laughs> and, and as a result, many buildings that were done didn't have roofs because roof, roofing nails are very, very small. 
So it was easiest to fulfill the plan by, and, and of course, you wanted to fulfill the plan because in, the incentives were there. Incentives didn't lack. Um, if you, if you, if you fill the, fulfill the plan and went a little bit above it, which is what everybody tried to do, um, you got a nice bonus. If you fell short of the plan a few years in a row, you got a nice trip to Siberia, to the Gulag. <laughs> so there were incentives. They set up the incentives. And, uh, so uh, it was mutual lying, of course. Uh, the, 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 the manager would say, uh, the, uh, the director of the whole industry would say, well, okay, you have to do X tons of nails. And he knew that they couldn't possibly produce that amount because he knew they were going to lie back to him. And they said, no, we can only do one-fourth X amount of nails. We can't produce that much. We don't have that capacity. And they would bargain like that. They'd lie to one another, and they'd come out with some figure, which the, uh, which the, the manager of the factory hoped he could just succeed and get a nice bonus and not go to Siberia. Okay. Well, they had problems with women's clothing were all oversized, okay? There was a huge market for American jeans, blue jeans, because they fit everybody, okay? They could, you know, fit any body shape. There were so many different kinds, sizes. And uh, the actual the Soviet go government looked the other way, okay? Um, there were ch children's clothing was in short supply. Building nails was in short supply. Um, well, one, once Khrushchev was giving a, a, a public speech and suddenly, to the Westerners who were listening to the speech, they were surprised. He started bashing the chandelier industry. Turns out that chandeliers, which were produced for the, the, uh, the dashas, the, the, the vacation homes of the comrades, were so heavy, because they were, the, the, the plan was in terms of tons, that they were falling, killing the comrades, that they were pulling the, <laughs> the ceilings down. OK. Um, here's a very uh, uh, um, interesting joke. That's the, uh, the Soviet planner telling, uh, the Soviet manager telling the director, I, I fulfilled my, my target for the year. Okay, that huge nail, because it was specified in terms of tons. Uh, there was a joke that was often told about um, when Soviet economists met American economists at international conferences, they would say, uh, well, just to go back for a moment, when Khrushchev, at one point in the 1950s, um, Khrushchev, the Soviet dictator at that point, um, took his shoe off in, the, in a UN meeting and banged it on, on the table and said, we will bury you, meaning economically we will bury you. So, the, so later on, the Soviet uh, economists would say to the American economists, yeah, we're going to bury you, but we're going to leave Hong Kong so we can see some prices. So, so we have, they, so, 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 and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, okay? Um, now, People have criticized, well, before I get to that, people have criticized Mises for, 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 on the following basis. They said, look, Mises said socialism was impossible, yet socialism lasted in the Soviet Union for 75 years. Okay? Well, Mises never denied that you could carry on production. It just wouldn't be rational production, and it eventually would break down. So what Mises, and what he pointed out was, and he said this in his first article, okay? he said, the Soviet Union is not a truly socialist nation. And the reason is, it's like the post office in the middle of a regular free market economy. Okay, a post office is owned by the government, is extremely inefficient, okay, and it used to be long lines and it was terrible to deal with. Okay, um, now, that, now it has some competition. But it still could roughly calculate because it could use the prices of the things around it. It knew basically what its costs were. Okay? And he said the, so the Soviet Union is the same way. It's a socialist island in the middle of a world of market prices. So, they, they, so the Soviets did use prices. They did, they did um, use Western prices for steel, and, and they, they traded their electricity to Eastern Europe, and, and there, there, were, there were prices. There was also bribery between the factories. Some factories had a surplus of certain things that they didn't need, and on the other hand, there were um, factories that needed that and had other things, and, and that was called blot. And so those things were traded, so, so there, there were prices. And, and they sort of used them. Um, and that's what kept it going for a while. Uh, uh, so so um, just one other quick thing I want to tell you. Oh, yes. Was there, was there true socialism ever? Um, Mises said, yeah, there was. From about 1918 to 1921, which is the period of war communism, when there was the white Russians fighting the, the, the communists, the supporters of the, of the, of the czar, um, at that point, they, they tried, Lenin tried to abolish all prices, okay, get rid of a, a, any reference to a, to a money price, and they did that. And what happened was that shortages of, shortages of everything just um, emerged. 
And people, at the end, people were beginning to burn their household furniture just to stay warm. And then their parts of their houses, and then they just left and went to the countryside and just foraged for um, you know, food and, and, and shelter and so on. So socialism, yes, it can work among nomadic tribes, among households, as, as we pointed out. Okay? But that means the starvation of you know, most of the population. Okay, so uh, let me just talk a little bit. Well, let, me, well, let me skip over this. Okay, what I just I just want to mention something. There's something called the social appraisement process. That's really the market operating to both um, have uh, generate costs and prices. So the entrepreneur and Peter Klein will talk about the entrepreneur. I think maybe later today or tomorrow. The entrepreneur is at the center of this whole process that generates prices and makes production rational. So what the entrepreneur does is look to the future, okay, he sees what consumers are buying now, and he, he thinks to himself how this will change. He makes a judgment about a year from now or two years from now, will people like tablet computers, for example, Steve Jobs, um, iPhones, um, and so on. And so you make a judgment based on what consumers are buying today. You, they might not, the, prop, the, the, um, the product might not be in existence today, okay, but yet, you need the resources to begin building the, 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 the product today. So based on what you believe the prices to be of consumer goods in the future, the entrepreneurs then bid against one another, okay, because they're all looking to produce different things, for the resources today. And so that determines the structure of prices. So if you want to produce anything, if any of you are would-be entrepreneurs, you can always freely use the existing price system to know what it's going to cost you. You can always know the cost of something you want to produce. You may make a mistake because you misjudge the future prices, but you can always know the, 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 the cost, and that's extremely important. That's what is lacking under socialism. So what Mises talked about was the intellectual division of labor. He said, everyone is involved in generating the price st structure. Consumers, capitalists, entrepreneurs, and laborers, okay? They meet on markets, and on markets, they, they exchange. And underlying those exchanges are everyone's valuations, choices, and which leads to those exchanges. And those are what generate prices. So prices are a social phenomenon, okay, or a social phenomenon, okay. One mind cannot generate prices. That's the failure of socialism, okay. Everyone, all of us, contributes a little bit to the formation of the whole price structure. But no one human will can ever come up with a price structure on his or her, you know his on his or her own, okay. So it allows everyone to compute money costs of any conceivable production process. Okay, I want to just talk a little bit about the socialist response. You had these nitwits in the 1920s. Um, one guy, a fanatical Marxist named Neurath, said, "Well, we can just calculate in kind. We'll just add up the tons of steel and the gallons of paint and so on." Okay, and Mises Mises just smashed that argument right from the beginning. Okay. Others said, let's calculate with labor hours. That is a homogeneous unit. Well, as you saw with Roger Garrison's um, talk the other day, it's not a homogeneous unit, OK? Um, is the labor hour of someone who, who does um, heart surgery the same, worth the same as a labor hour of, of someone that runs a backhoe for a construction company? I think not. Is, even in the same industry, is, is the labor hour of LeBron James the same as, as the gawky guy, 12th man sitting on a bench? No, of course not. So they're not really homogeneous. Okay, just by saying the word, it applies to a variety of, of different types of hours and different qualities. And finally, that leaves out machines and natural resources. So capital goods and natural resources are used. The more they're used, the more productive labor is. Okay, so a guy digging a ditch with a, 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 um, a, sh a, a spade and, 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 and um, a shovel is not the same as a guy, or, or can't produce as much as a guy who's running a backhoe, right? Labor hour is very, very different in, in productivity. Also, assume a stationary economy. This is a favorite of these naive guys. What they said was, you know what? On the last day of capitalism, we'll just keep the managers and the foremen on, and we'll just tell them on the next day, the first day of socialism, just do the same thing. Come to work at the same time, and so on. Well, of course, if, every, if nothing ever changes, if pe people's uh, tastes never change, if technology never improves, if you never find more natural resources, or if 
natural resources aren't depleted. You can do the same thing over and over again. But that's not the real world. The real world, the real economic world is dynamic. It's continually changing, OK? And in order to know what to do in the real world, you need to have profits and losses, OK? Look, there, before there was an iPhone, I mean, you, you wouldn't have an iPhone here, right? You wouldn't have any new, new technology coming in, right, in, in a socialist world. Uh, and then there were sophisticated responses uh, in the 1930s. In the 1920s, those naive responses that I was talking about to Mises, they were mainly by German economists. But then um, when Hayek went to Great Britain from Austria, um, he, he brought with him uh, so, some of the ideas of the socialist calculation debate that Mises had, had developed, and he developed them on his own and uh, published a book of, of um, writings on, on socialism uh, by himself and Mises and, and, and others. And so the uh, neoclassical economists uh, in Great Britain became interested, and in the US, became interested in this question. So one of the things they said was, um, take the mathematical solution, what we can do is we'll just collect all the information about resources, all different types of resources, the amounts and so on, quantities and qualities, and we'll collect the information about people's, um, the amount of labors we have and labor, potential labor hours that can be used, and about the capital goods, and then we'll put them in simultaneous supply and demand equations, and then we'll solve those equations, and we'll get the right quantities and the right prices for all these goods. Okay. Okay, and there's a real problem with that, which I'll get to. I just want to talk about the, the market socialists before I, I get to the problem. Market socialists said that um, what we could do is tell the managers of the factories that they should minimize their costs, okay, and set their prices at their average cost so they won't earn profits, but they'll be covering their costs and they'll be selling. Uh, producing goods just up to the point where the cost equals the price. Now, who's going to set the price? The prices were going to be set by the planners themselves through a trial and error method. So uh, they would set the price of steel at a certain level, let's say $600 a ton. If there was a surplus of steel, well, that meant steel was just too much. Too much. Um, uh, the, the, the price is too high. They'll lower it to 200 And then it might be a short deal. And eventually, through trial and error, they'll find the right price. Okay. That's what they claimed. All right, so what were the res responses? Um, Hayek and Robbins, who was a British economist, they said, well, this is impractical. Okay, by the time you collect all that knowledge that's necessary to solve all these equations, and by the way, in the 1930s, there were no computers. It would, it would take months and months, if not years, to solve one set of equations. Um, by that time, things would have changed already, and that knowledge is uh, obsolete, and those prices and quantities would be ob obsolete. Okay. Um, so there was a really, it was impractical to change prices in a timely manner. And also, you wouldn't be able to get all of the information that people had in their heads about how to produce different things, OK? Because it all had to be centralized. And what Mises said is that, first of all, the, the, uh, so, the socialist market um, uh, or, or market socialism is playing with numbers. Okay, it's just playing, uh, it's called a playing market. It's like children trading back and forth, okay? The, because the, the things, the decisions that children make are really made by their parents. Their parents have bought them certain things, certain toys. Their parents have decided, you know, what they can play with and, and how much time they have to play with it. So when they're trading, that's just determined ultimately by the ultimate decision maker. So what Mises says is that, look, the market economy is not a managerial economy. We can't just have managers making these, these, these low-level decisions and say, that's the market. In fact, you want people, who's going to make the decisions about liquidating certain firms, destroying them, and creating new firms? Right. Who's going to do that? Mises says, in the market economy, that's done by entrepreneurs. It's done on the stock market and bond market and commodity markets. Uh, and there would be, under market socialism, there would be no um, stock market, okay, because the government would own everything. So the prices would not be real prices. They're not real market prices. Just by setting up the firms as they do and hiring the managers that they do and telling them to produce certain amounts or, or, or setting the firms up at a certain size, they are determining the outcome 
and they're determining it without knowing any prices. Okay. So there, there really is no way around, uh, uh, if you want a rational economy and rational allocation of resources, there's no way around uh, uh, having a laissez-faire economy. I'll stop there. Thank you.